Well, Darren, it's a real pleasure to uh, visit with you today. It's uh, I have to tell you, anybody who gets their own catalog at Heritage Auctions must be a very, very special person. Yeah, well, it's the artwork that's special, I think. I was, I was very lucky. I started collecting over 20 years ago, back when the internet was um, a much cheaper place to buy art than it is these days. Well, look, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Because in this auction, there are, I believe, about 73 pieces of artwork that you're offering. And it's an extraordinary assemblage spanning Windsor McKay to Alan Moore, Frank Miller, to everybody who has probably made a significant contribution to the world of art. I think about the fact that there's Alex Ross, there's Bill Sienkiewicz. There's just an extraordinary amount. There's a page from Daredevil One. And we'll get to all of that in just a minute. But I did want to talk to you up front, at least, about what began your journey toward collecting? Because as a storyteller yourself, I'm always very interested. Is it the art that got you interested in these pages, or is it the story that got you interested in these pages to begin with? Uh, well, for, for me, comics, they're always intertwined. Um, sure. you know, a great comic strip is both the words and the art. But yeah, which, um, I began, I was reading comics since I was a child. Uh, I was born uh, in London and I grew up in Ireland. So it was mostly British comics in the early days. Uh, the relaunched Eagle, 2000 AD. And then in my teens, I began finding access to uh, American comics. And I started I started about 14, 15 on Watchmen, Love and Rockets, um, Dark Knight Returns, Killing Joke, you know, and these just fueled my love for the genre. And I've always uh, loved comics. I loved them before then, but my real love for them developed from that point onwards. Right. And then fast forward about 10 years, uh, a bit more even, um, I started making money for my books. Until that point, you know, I was a penniless wannabe <laughs> author. I lived with my parents, I wrote in my bedroom. You know, the idea of spending money had never crossed my mind because I had no money to spend. Uh, then when free came out and it started, you know, selling in significant volumes, I said my bank account suddenly shot up. But well, I didn't have a bank account before that. I only opened a bank account when I got my first check for a certain freak. And um, I started wondering, well, what am I going to spend it on? You know, I didn't want to just go and invest it because money has never sort of interested me. It's nice having it, but I've never lived for the pursuit of money. And, um, you know, I wasn't interested in doing finance and buying apartments and things like that. And um, I suddenly, when I was sur surfing around online, I suddenly realised, well, not suddenly, but I began to realise that art from my favorite comics was available. And there was pieces from Watchmen, Killing Joke, all these things start, w w were out there. And I started thinking, well, that'd be cool. That'd be really good, you know, as an investment. Okay, it should hold its money over time. But mainly it was because the idea of having pages on the wall from the comics that I had absolutely loved, it, it just excited me. It got me really, really excited. Did they serve as an inspiration for you as well to have those pieces right there on the wall accessible to you? Absolutely. I mean, my work has been inspired hugely by comics. Um, Watchmen, for me, is the best story that I've ever read in any format. Um, Cerebus, the scale of Cerebus, you know, the story of over 300 issues. As a, as a teenager in the early 20s, when I was reading that, I just thought, wow, you know, could I ever do something on that sort of scale? And, you know, my my series, Cert Freak, was 12 books. I've written a couple other series a long series of 10 books, 12 books, nine books. And yeah, I think you can trace that back to Cer for it to, um, to Cerebus, this idea of taking a story beyond the scale of just one, you know, simple book of making it into this big multi, multi saga. It's all, it's Dave Sims set a high bar and it's right. all, it challenged me as a writer to try and push myself further than I had done up to that point. So yeah, well, I see a, lot of my, um, a lot of ideas in my books generated in, in these comics. Well, it's interesting, right? Because you've got, you know, someone was asking me the other day about comic art. Is it the writer or is it the artist? And I said, look, when Frank Miller, obviously it's it's one and the same. But if you look at Alan Moore and he has other artists interpreting his work, to me, you can't you can't separate the two to the point you were making a moment ago. So not only are you surrounding yourself with great artists, but you're surrounding yourself with the words, the images, the ideas and the intention of the, the author who put it in front of them and who co who collaborated with them on those moments. Absolutely. Um, it's always for me, yeah, you know, obviously for, for a story to work, ideally the two have to be both on the game. So like Alan Moore has done stuff with lesser artists, which hasn't been so good. You know, you've got great art, artists who've done work with 
lesser writers and it hasn't been so good. But when you get the two of them working in perfect unison, you know, Boland and Moore on Killing Joke right. and Gibbons and Moore on Watchmen, they lift each other and it becomes something way, way more. It's a real incredible teamwork on, on a really good comic strip. And for me, there, there is no divide. You know, I look at a page of comic art and even though obviously the writer hasn't drawn it, that is the collaboration between the writer and the artist. Um, yeah, you, you just can't, you can't separate them for me. So do you remember the first piece you bought in, in this would have been what, 2000? <sighs> no, I, I, I don't. Um, I remember some of them, some of the early pieces, the memorable early pieces would have been from Alan Moore strips because he was my, my ultimate favorite. Well, let's let's so let's talk about Alan Moore because certainly, you know, to have a page from Watchmen, to have pages from Killing Joke, certainly that says to me that this is somebody who's deeply in love with Alan Moore's work. What was it about Alan? And certainly, I can, I or any other comic book uh, aficionado and fan can talk to you all day long about what makes these pages special to them. But what made his work so special to you? And as we look at this page from Watchmen, obviously, you know, this is certainly. Every page from that book is important. Every page from that book, from that series, is memorable. What was it for you? I mean, I mean, talking of more, I, I grew up with Alan Moore. Um, I started reading his stories in 2000 AD, so before I had any idea who he was, I, right. I, I read the stories that he wrote, and they really stood out. Um, there were future shocks that were called, and he wrote a series called The Ballad of Halo Jones, and that was very, very different to anything else I'd read at the time. So he impacted on me very, very early. I actually met him at a signing a long, long time ago. I must have been 13 or 14 years of age. And I went up my two volumes of, of Halo Jones to get him to sign them um, in Forbidden Planet in London. So that's like 30, well over 30 years ago. <laughs> and um, with Watchmen, I mean, when I read Watchmen, it just blew my mind. It still does. Anytime I go back to it, it's just such an amazing work. You look at a page that I was selling, there's just so much in there. You know, Sharks throwaway line you quit it's just it's it says so much with so little and it, it's just beautiful um i'm sorry i didn't get more watchman pieces over the years um the others did come up but i um they, they never come up very often um, <laughs> come up over the years and the prices i got that very early on and the prices began to shoot up quite soon afterwards and because I got that page for such a good price, I was sort of reluctant to stretch myself beyond it and because it was such a lovely page. But, um, yeah, I mean, Watch, Watchmen just worked on every single sort of level. And every time I went back to it, I'd always find something new. There'd always be something Watchmen that I hadn't noticed before, no matter how many times I reread it. Oh, it's funny. It's a book I probably go back to once a year. That Dark Knight and Killing Joke mm -hmm. are probably the three comics I revisit the most. Yeah. Yeah, they're just amazing. Well, let's talk about Killing Joke as well. There's two pages from Killing Joke. And to me, Killing Joke is probably the greatest Joker story ever told. It certainly makes him more understandable, more... You don't want to say that he necessarily comes off as more um, relatable or you feel compassion for the character, but certainly that is the end result from the totality of this book. And these pages in particular are incredibly special. Talk about when you first read Killing Joke and what these two, and getting these two pages meant for you. Yeah, Killing Joke, I, again, I've been, in my early teens, I came across, I bought Killing Joke and I loved it. I think it was actually, I might have read that before Watchmen, before Dark Knight Returns, because it was shorter. Um, I think I, I probably read that first. I got them all around the same time. Um, I, I just think you feel so much sorrow for the character, even though he's an evil character, and even though he does terrible things in, in this graphic novel particularly you see where, how he's landed up in this situation. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful work. Um, I remember when I was buying them, there were other pages from the book, which I could have bought, which were sort of um, fancier sort of pages. You know, they had shots of Batman or his car. And it, these two pages, they got to the heart of who the Joker was. It's the real human side of him. And these were the two that I was most drawn towards. And they're the two that I chose. because There were actually several available. Um, yeah, obviously, 20 years down the line, I'm sorry, I didn't buy a whole lot of them. <laughs> but, um, these were two that I cherry-picked. They just, uh, I love that. For me, that that's what was the real draw of this book in particular. It was the humanity of the Joker. With all the craziness, with all the horror in there, you just really, really feel for him. Um, you, know, you get to the end of the book, and he's on this path that he cannot get off. Of, off. He sees that, he, you know, he wishes he could get off it, but he just can't turn away 
from who he has become. And this book shows how he became that person. And yeah, like, like I say, I could have bought ones with the car and you know more going on, but those two pages really, really spoke to me. And yeah, they, they, they were especially hard to part with. Well, you know, it's interesting to me because I, I can't think of Watchmen without thinking of Killing Joke, without thinking of Dark Knight Returns. Certainly, they all came out very close together. The, they spoke to each other in different ways. Certainly, Alan and Frank were talking during that period about uh, there was that four-month gap between book three and book four and Dark Knight. And uh, Frank told me recently that he was talking to Alan a little bit about what he was up to with Watchmen. And certainly, all of this goes to this really interesting idea of the deconstruction of and reconstruction of superheroes, supervillains, and our ideas of and interactions with those characters. And I sort of wonder if that's what, in a lot of ways, draws you to these as well. Because as a storyteller, again, you're talking about reinventing 80-year-old characters in a way that, at this point, I guess it would have been 40, 50 years old. But to reinvent them in such a way that they become wholly unrecognizable um, and yet incredibly relatable to what we've always imagined them to be. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I only really came to realize later on. That I, I was really spoiled. You know, as a teenager... Uh, in the late 80s, you know, you, you, you had all these coming along in space for a couple of years, um, even less. You know, Watchmen, Killing Joke, uh, Dark Knight. You know, I, I just thought it was going to be like this all the time. I thought this is how comics worked. <laughs> but every year you, you had three or four classics like this, and it was going to be that way for the rest of my life. <laughs> and it's only later on I realised just how fortunate I was to have been a teenager reading comics at, at that particular time. Yeah, but, but they changed so much. It was... Um, they very rewrote, I think, what comics could be, and what, how they could work, and the audience they could work for. They, they, they rewrote the rules, and they did it easily. It just seems, you know, it just seems so straightforward when you read them. You know, there was nothing like these three volumes before that. And you look at them now, now in hindsight, you go, oh, yeah, that was always. You know, you can't, it's hard to imagine the world without the Killing Joke. But that was such a revolutionary work, and um, it's only, you know, as I've travelled further down the line from that point, but I came to realise just how monumental these works were. I thought, when I read them originally, they were just incredible, cool works. They blew my mind. But I assumed there were far more works like that out there. That It's just me dipping my toes into the water and I would discover more and more works like these from, from there on. Um, you know, it's only, you know, looking back at it now, I realise just how special they were and just how lucky we are to have, have them. I mean, it's fascinating to me too when I think about it. Because then you start having to expand all of this. And I'd like to look at that, uh, that page from Dark Knight as well, because that's certainly one of my favorite pages in that it's incredibly subtle. It's incredibly funny. Uh, it, it touches on all the themes, certainly of book four, uh, the, the ultimate showdown with um, Superman there when Superman disappears from Reagan. And there is just something just sort of magical about every single page from Dark Knight. What has it attracted you about this specific page? Uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, there wasn't much choice ever with Dark Knight. Very few pages did come up I, over the years when I was heavily collecting art. It was very, very rare that a page from Dark Knight ever became available. So um, I would have taken it no matter what. But uh, yeah, <laughs> as you say, pretty much every page of Dark Knight Returns is special. Um, whenever I flick through it, you know, I can always remember a page. I, if I open up the one, I open it up now. Sometimes I look for an old comic that I haven't read in years and I've forgotten loads of it. And I'll be looking at the pages and it'll be like reading it for the first time. Yeah, you know, with Dark Knight, I, every page in there I, I can remember. I can remember when I was a teenager when I was reading them. Um, I mean, this one, you, you obviously got, you got Superman Fly, which is an, inc an incredible image. Um, you know, you've got old Bruce Wayne there chatting to him. You've got the prison cell, all the inmates in there. <laughs> President Ronnie in his <laughs> radiation bath saying, hey, bad news, folks, but good news as well. It's just the whole, the whole thing was, um, yeah, I, I, Miller's done a lot of great work. I've loved, you know, I love um, Sin City. Um, he's dead, never worked before that. But I felt with Dark Knight, especially the first volume, volume of it, he just went to a whole different place of it. And, and it's not a bad auction to have your Dark Knight Returns art in, given the fact that this is the first time the cover to Dark Knight Returns book one has ever been in an auction. So you, you share an auction with a very historic piece of that particular book. I saw that. Yeah, if, if only it had come up 20 years ago, <laughs> that could have been mine. <laughs> 
So I want to talk to you about the journey toward collecting too, because, you know, look, it is, as we said, great writers. It's Grant Morrison on Arkham Asylum, it's including Dave McKeon as well. So, I mean, it is, again, all these collaborations that you have made a part of your life. But certainly it has expanded beyond the world of superheroes. And, and I believe you talked about in your essay about the fact that you weren't familiar with, you know, Windsor McKay. You weren't necessarily a little Nemo reader. Uh, you were a comic book guy. Like me, you went to the comic shop or you went to your pharmacy and grabbed whatever was on the spinner rack that caught your eye and caught your attention and caught your affection. So how did the journey for you change in terms of what you began to collect and who you began to appreciate? Yeah, so when it started off, I'd be um, I'd search for specific items. So whether it was a page from a certain comic or an artist or a writer. But then I began broadening my net because I'd be, I'd be on all these sites and I'd read all these different other um, pages from pieces I'd never heard about. And I'd be looking down through them and I'd see different things. It was really nice. I used to go on all sorts of different sites, on auction pages, on eBay. And yeah, there'd be things I'd be looking for. But then I'd also come across things that I wasn't aware of. And I, I, can, I remember coming across Windsor Mackay, and um, I hadn't heard of him at the time. If you, again, we're going back to the early noughties. He's become much better known now, I think. Right. Um, you know, and he, you know, the internet was only getting kicking off. You know, he wasn't really really that uh, well known, certainly not by, but not by me. And I began seeing these images that were 100 years old, and I began reading up about him and how he'd started out and the short movies he'd made. Um, Gertie the dinosaur, obviously, uh, sinking of the Lusitania, I think it was. And then obviously, Little little Nemo. And uh, I managed to get hold of a graphic novel, complete graphic novel of all the Nemo works in it, and just tore through that. And um, yeah, I mean, Nemo has been so, so influential. Even though I hadn't read McKay before then, I had I was familiar with his work through lots of other writers and artists who had drawn from it uh, and whose work, work I did love. Um, it's just so imaginative, the, the little Nemo stuff. And I was very, very lucky, very, very fortunate. I got a few um, pages. I got a lot of his political work. A lot of right, that's what I want to ask you about. How did you then decide, all right, because certainly one can see in the, the little Nemo stuff, it's certainly been incredibly impactful on any number of cartoonists. Gary Trudeau, who uh, who, who created Doonesbury, is a huge Windsor McKay fan. Um, I worked uh, in college with Chris Ware, who was an enormous Windsor McKay fan and who obviously was a George Harriman fan with Crazy Cat. We also have a, a Crazy Cat piece here as well. But talk to me about what it was about these political pieces that drew you to them as much as to the pieces that were more famous. I actually, I, when I started buying his work, it was the political pieces I bought originally because Little Nemo pieces didn't come up very often. They just, they were so timely, even though they've been you know published maybe a hundred years ago, give or take a few decades. They were still, you could look at these pieces and they still related to today's world. There was a lot in there that just, yeah, it, it intrigued me. And it's not something I would normally collect. It's not something I would normally gravitate towards. But there was just something about the McKay political pieces that I just, I, I, they, they felt like they were coming off today's news headlines. And um, yeah, they, they just really drew, they, they drew me in. And I ended up buying lots of them. Um, and as I say, it's not something I would normally go for. But yeah, they, they all look lovely. They look like his artwork was always stunning and yeah i don't know they, they, they drew me in to my surprise as i say it wasn't something i would have anticipated buying a lot of but um yeah i, 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 I couldn't stop for a while i'd just keep seeing you know these political pieces coming up and i'll just go oh, yeah that's really cool but yeah I, 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 i'm gonna get that and um yeah they just it's neem obviously is what he's best known for today but you know back back in when he was uh, publishing you know the political pieces were i think what he was most famous for well, see, that's the interesting thing. I've, to me, I found that fascinating about his work when I started to get interested into it, in, in it as well, which is that I thought, how am I going to love something that's that old? Because certainly, you know, again, I, I, I'm 53 years old. I was in high school and in college when Dark Knight and Killing Joke and all these other books came out. I'd grown up on the works of Neil Adams and Jim Aparo and all these other guys. And, you know, my style and my my favorites were very specific to you know, caped crusaders, as it were. Um, but then when I started to look back in Chris Ware, when I was in college at the University of Texas, introduced me to George Harriman and Crazy Cat and talked about how that was an enormous influence on his work with Jimmy Corgan. And then you begin to realize that work that was done a century ago 
looked as brand new as anything that was coming out today. I mean, it looked as fresh as tomorrow. You can't go back and look at any of that Little Nemo stuff and think, my God, how is this guy not recognized as one of the greatest pioneers of this genre by anybody who has any any interest in or affection for? Yeah, absolutely. Great work will stand up. Um, I, find, yeah, I, I love cinema and I love watching old movies, you know, going back to the silent era. And a lot of silent movies are, are hard to watch today. But <laughs> the excellent ones, as you say, are as fresh as ever. They really stand up. The, the top draw, Chaplin or Keaton or... Uh, or Harold Lloyd, you right. can still enjoy them. You don't have to allow for them. A lot of silent cinema, you have to allow for it. Um, a lot of old comic strips, you have to make allowances. But the really, really good stuff, the, the Nemo, the political cartoons, they stand the test of time. This is something that a great artist at the top of his game, it, the years don't take away from that. And um, the, the banal stuff, it does. It gets forgotten about. It ends up being lost. But the great stuff, it, you know, it's been enjoyed now, 100 years from now, it will still be enjoyed because it just there's something about it that just elevates it and, and is timeless. So as you begin that journey of discovery to some of these other artists, is that how you found George Harriman as well? Yeah, again, it was just going around. I, I spotted some of his stuff on, on the, on, online, on one of the auction sites, and I clicked through. I was, it made me chuckle. And I love I the big crazy cat page. It's... Um, I used to have that in uh, my downstairs uh, WC, so I used to see it very, very often. And I'd, 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 I'd read it at least once a week. I'd read through, and I'd always chuckle by the end of it. It's just a really, really cool um, page. And uh, yeah, like I say, I, I never got tired. Yeah, you know, normally with a punchline, you think, yeah, you, know, you read it once, and that's it. And, but I, I kept on returning to that, and it would always make me smile. Yeah, there is something really special about Crazy Cat that um, I bought my first collection of crazy cat uh, probably in 1989 uh which wow. is when i was deep into my uh, you know the dark dc stuff and the and the frank miller daredevils and all that stuff that was certainly all in vogue amongst us brooding college students in austin texas at the time yeah i kept it much later you know i wanted to talk to you too about the fact that as you began to assemble this collection and as Crazy Cat and Little Nemo began to populate your collection alongside Batman and Daredevil and all of these pieces as well, how did you then begin to decide, begin to decide which pieces to go after, which pieces to collect? Because I assume at some point, all of this art starts to form sort of a dialogue amongst each other in your personal collection as you decide where to place it, as you decide what to look at, as you're doing your own writing. Um, I assume that there's... that. It's not just, and maybe this is the wrong assumption, that it's not just, oh, I love that artist, but I don't necessarily love that story. I love the story, but I may not love the artist. Did it begin to change the direction in which your collection went? Overall, no, not really. Mostly I bought pages from strips that I loved. Yeah. Um, strips that I'd read and enjoyed. And there were occasional outliers like Mackay, like... Um, a crazy cat but most of it was bought from, from works that were really really dear to me so for daredevil yeah i loved the, i didn't read the early daredevils but i loved frank miller's daredevil sure and uh, and, and another daredevil since then um i've i've, I've always had a, a soft spot for daredevil uh, so when the page from daredevil number one came up even though that wouldn't have been a comic i would have read back you know back back in the day um because i had this association with daredevil through frank miller primarily you know, I, I wanted to get that because I had other Daredevil pieces that Miller had drawn, and I just thought, oh, it's really cool. Now I'd have from the very first uh, issue linked up with with the Miller issues. So usually for me, there was that connection to story. Um, yeah. Almost all of the collection, almost all of it, except as I say, for a few pieces and sp specifically uh, Mac Winter Mackay. Um, it was that there were pages bought from works which had impacted on me that were really important to me and that's why i always felt um a really, really close connection to them I, I, I collect um other art as well from you know more, more traditional sort of artists and yeah i enjoy that but i never get the same buzz from a, a normal piece of art as i do from a comic art because it comes from the, the story it's that link with the story to me normally comes first I mean, this is like getting a piece of a story that I love. And it's just, um, yeah, it's a, 
it's been, it's been very, very special to have, have these pieces for so many years. Well, I love the Daredevil too, right? Because it goes from Daredevil to the origin story. I mean, to, to own a piece of that first issue, I mean, that's a whole different thing, right? I mean, it's 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 a iconic character who maybe did not get his propers until Frank Miller actually, you know, that yeah. book was in danger of getting canceled until Frank Miller got on board. Um, but then to go back and own this piece, and, you know, I've always, I think this book is probably one of the 10 best Daredevil stories ever ever told not just because of its place in this in the in the narrative but it's just a, a beautifully told tale and yeah. i sort of wonder you know what is that as someone who has always wanted to own and collect comic art but who spent 30 years in journalism so unlike you my writing career did not necessarily afford me to buy the best of the best of the comic book art what is it like to own that piece from daredevil number one it was it was lovely um i'll be honest it didn't mean as much to me as owning a piece from comics that i've actually read yeah so I mean, you know owning a page from watchmen owning page, pages from killing joke maybe a bit more on a personal level maybe a bit more to be daredevil having a page from issue one was obviously i was aware this is a huge important page you know, this is a key page and i really enjoyed it but you know i didn't have the same emotional connection to it and I did to you know, even even less than no works from you know, like like the page from Sandman that's up there. You know, Sandman, yeah. I love the Sandman comics. Um, that had a huge impact on me. Um, the Cerebus pages. You know, the, or to have the Frank Miller Cloud Mantle uh, piece from Daredevil. I, I admired the Daredevil page. page. You know, I love the fact that he's, his dad is in there. It's the first yeah. time the name of Daredevil is mentioned. And all those, you know, all those levels, it really sort of fills me. But um, yeah, but, but sort of a teenage boy inside me who really gets excited when I get a page from Killing Joke or Cerebus. Yeah, the teenage boy was going, yeah, yeah that's all right, which is <laughs> a terrible confession to make, I know. But, but, then you got, but, but then you can pair it with the piece from Daredevil 183, which is Frank and Klaus. So therefore, they do then form, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with the idea that these pages can form a kind of a dialogue with each other because you have a piece from Daredevil 1 and then 183, which you would have read by someone yeah, whose yeah. work you were familiar with. Absolutely, yeah. And I never actually put them together, um, the, which is one of the reasons why I sort of have decided to um, to sell so many pieces. Because I had, I had about 350 pieces in total in my collection. Wow. And a lot of pieces just got lost. They were sitting in folders. Now, I didn't have wall space to hang 350 pages, I, I wish I did, but yeah, you'd have to be in a, in a, in a gallery to, to hang that many pieces. And so yeah, I wasn't able to do a lot of what I planned to do with the collection. Like you say, you know, take those Miller pieces, hang them next to that, you know, have an old Mackay piece next to something that's, you know, a Chris Ware page. But, you know, there was just so many pieces there, I sort of got a bit overwhelmed by it in the end. You know, I, I went wild, especially there was, you know, a five, 10 year period in the start of the noughties, where I was just buying, yeah, for, for fun. It was just so much was out there. The prices hadn't gone crazy. And I was just, you know, I'd go online and, you know, I'd bid a few thousand. I'd get, you know, these amazing pages coming in. And, you know, they were coming in all the time. And you do get a little bit, um, you know, sort of, oh, that's another, that's another Daredevil page. Oh, that's another Watchmen page. Oh, yeah, it's nice. And so I wanted to take myself back to just having, you know, a sm much smaller collection where I can actually put the pieces up and see them and, do things like play them around with each other. And having so many, it just, yeah, I sort of, um, yeah, I couldn't keep on top of it. So things well, like that, of putting the Daredevils together, I never, never did it. Well, you know, it's interesting, right? Because a lot of collectors talk about how they are temporary custodians of the things that they own. So if you are, in fact, paring it down, I assume that you obviously keep things that maybe spoke a little more profoundly to you. And you can part with things that you've lived with for a very long time and then want to share with somebody else who can enjoy them and appreciate them as you have. It was a real mix. Um, there were some pages I've given up, which I really felt uh, attached to, but I just felt that from, from a financial point of view, the, the prices, like, like the Daredevil page, the prices have just gone, gone so high, it just made sense to let them go. Right. And there were other pages. Um, the Frank Miller Star Wars page. That's a page I've really loved. A lot of these, this collection... I said it would be in folders. I wouldn't see it that often. Um, the Star Wars page was in a little folder that I kept in my hallway. And I used to I used to flick through it, you know, once or twice a week, changing the pages. So I would see that constantly, you know, it'd be, it'd be on display, you know, 
for a couple of weeks at a time and then you know a couple of hours later it'll be back again and I, I love that page it's a page I, that was the last page actually that i um put in my to sell pile and actually really? i put it, i took it off i put it on again i took it off again and i did with that page um i felt i've enjoyed this for so long now it is time to let someone else enjoy it uh, so some of the pages i've held on to are pages that i've particularly loved but i've also let some pages go that i really really love and that one in particular um it was just it's a great image obviously it's by frank miller he signed it as well the guy who sold it to me told him he took he took it to him at a, a convention and he signed it there and he's just staring at it for ages you know sort of looking at it because obviously it was a piece he hadn't seen for a long while and um yeah i i really hovered hesitated with that one but ultimately it was one of those things i thought well look i have really enjoyed this some of the pieces that i'm keeping are pieces i haven't seen that much over the last 20 years and so i'm going to frame them and put them up and enjoy them more over the next 10 15 years but that page i really had got a lot out of it and i just felt yeah, yeah let somebody else be the lucky owner of this now it's time to send that out there and even though that really really wrenched at me to let them go but it was one of those things i just felt yeah i'm, I'm, I'm going to send this now as a uh, for, for good kudos what about let's talk a little bit about the dave sims pages how difficult is it to get rid of some of them given the fact that he was in fact a big influence on your own writing and, and the way you approach your works and your novels huge influence and um, i also i got to communicate with him quite a lot over the years um, my first published work was a fan letter in cerebus <laughs> back when i was at university and um and then years later i started finding his work and we started communicating with each other and chatting and we'd send letters. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I thought I was gonna hold on to a lot more of the Cerebus pages than I ultimately have. Uh, as I went through my collection, um, I, I've got page one from issue one. And sort of when you've got page one, issue one, I just felt it'd be greedy of me to hold on to the rest of them. I, I was trying at one point to collect pages from issue one i've got i've got several of them and i, I just felt you know this is this is for me you know i've got so much great service work but nothing's going to touch issue one page one. even though the artwork obviously was very very rough with, with that one compared to his later pages i just felt yeah as much as i love the rest of his stuff i also held on he did a recreation of the number one cover for me and i held on to that as well because he'd signed it to me and that, that felt very um careful he ended up doing like it in four pages but the rest, I had, I had some lovely, lovely pages. I actually had a page from the issue in which my um, letter had appeared. I think issue one, five, six or some, something like that. Uh, it, it's up in, in the auction. But um, yeah, I just that was another one where I just felt, look, if I hold on to these, I'm, I'm not gonna love them as much as this one. I used to, the, the issue four was the only one that I was, I, I came very close to keeping. That's the earliest extant issue of Cerebus. And um, and I used to read that, but I used to, again, that was another one that I had in my corridor in a folder, and I would turn over the pages um, once a week, once every couple of weeks, and I'd read through it. It's, it's, it's my most read issue of Cerebus, because I used to read it over and over and over. And um, I was reluctant to let, to let that one go. But um, again, I've had it for so long, and I've enjoyed it so much. I've read it dozens and dozens of times now by this stage. Again, I just felt, yeah, look. I mean, you can't display 22 pages of comic art from one story. It's just impractical. Yeah. Well, well it, was, it was lovely having it in the folder. And as I say, I would read it. So I'd read it. <laughs> and a couple of weeks, like, weeks later, I'd read pages two and three. So, but I, so I, I love doing that. But um, yeah, I, I just felt it was time to let that one go as well. It was just time to turn it over. And hopefully, hopefully whoever ends up with it will keep it together. Um, I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Obviously, it's not something I can control. But I'd love, as I say, because it is the earliest complete issue and i'm hoping it, it will stay whoever collects it has as much love for it as, as i had and holds on to it as i've done and you know 20 30 years down the line passes it on to someone who loves it just as much you know it occurs to me that we have not yet looked at those uh pages from arkham asylum those dave mckeon uh painted pages from uh arkham asylum uh which i just you know certainly grant morrison is one of the great comic book writers great comic book influences brought an incredible humanity to comic books in some ways that that other writers have missed over the years. Um, these pieces are, I have to say, I don't think I've looked at some of these pieces since I've read the book, which has probably been a couple of years ago, but you don't often see these painted pages from Arkham Asylum come available, do you? 
No. Um, from, from a purely artistic, from a purely art point of view, I think Arkham Asylum is probably my favourite graphic novel um, in terms of the, of the images of what Dave McKean has done. I'm a huge David McKean fan, as you can tell from the collection. You know, I've collected loads of his work over the years. Uh, I brought work from as many of his comics and also his, his short books, but books that he's, he's worked on as, as, I've been, as I've been able to get. Uh, but Arkham Asylum was on, the, was on the first ones. I think it might have been the first McKean work. I'd seen his covers on Sandman, but I think that was the first fully painted McKean story that I'd, that I'd read. And I was oh, looking at it now. It's just incredible work. And um, yeah, they, they came up um, on, on a site one day and I just jumped for joy when I, when I got those. They were just amazing, amazing pieces. Um, yeah, like I said, I love all, I love all McKean's work. But those Arkham Asylum pages, I just felt he was at the top of his game for us. I realize that you and I could probably spend several hours discussing at great length every page and every artist, the fact that there's stuff from uh, the Hernandez brothers, the stuff that, I mean, they're, the, the collection spans an extraordinary breadth. You could probably do a museum display of the art of comic book art for the last hundred years based upon the collection that you have. But I have to ask you about... How difficult is it to part with that Bob Kane Batman? Oh, that was, um, as I say, the uh, Star Wars was the one, the last piece I put aside. The, the Batman was the second to last one. Um, yeah, oh, I'm oh, don't show it to me. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, re I regret the, I don't regret it. I decided I was going to sell it, and so I'm letting it go. But um, yeah, I really, really, came very, very close to holding it. I, I put it on the pile, I took it off. I, I was gonna hold on to it, but um, I don't know, I've, I've let it go now. I can't, I can't change it. <laughs> but yeah, if, if, if I could sort of pull one piece back, it'd be the Batman piece. As I said, Star Wars, I'd, sit, I'd seen that so much, I, I felt I'd, um, I'd got all of it, all I could out of it. Um, the Batman piece, I probably could have another 10 years without, I think, uh, easily. But uh, look, it's, it's someone else's good fortune. It's a uh, it's an amazing work by Kane. I think it's just a, yeah, it's obviously it's a recreation of a, of a panel from the early Batman, but just seeing, you know, early, early Bob Kane brought to life that way by Bob Kane. Ah, oh, yeah. I think I made a mistake. <laughs> well, I, I will try to buy it and give it back to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Before I let you go, uh, it seems only fair to ask you if there's anything of your own work that uh, folks watching this video uh, that you want to make folks aware of. Certainly you are a, a, a best-selling and a beloved author, and uh, it's a great thrill just to talk to you about other people's work, but I don't want to slight your own work before we wrap this thing up. Oh, well, thanks. I, I wasn't expecting that. Um, I mean, look, um, most of you know, I'm best known for Cert the Freak. That was a uh, first um, book for children, teenagers that I published back in 2000. And there's been a movie of it. Hopefully, it's going to be a TV re re TV reboot. I was about to ask you if there's a TV reboot in the works. I understand. There's, there's a team working on it, so um, we haven't got to the production stage yet. But um, yeah, we've got some good people involved, so hopefully, we're, we're going to take that forward. But um, yeah, we um, as I say, there's no buttons being go buttons pressed yet. But it's, it's looking looking positive. Uh, I mean, certainly is my most famous, the Demonata. Uh, was my 10 book series about demons, my goriest series. I'm often sold as a horror writer, which, yeah, you know, I, I cover different genres, but the demon artist the focus right. is definitely what wasn't horror with, with that one. Well, all I know is that uh, I think Cirque du Freak has one of my favorite John C. Riley performances. So we have that, uh, we have you to thank for that. So I, uh, I certainly do appreciate that amongst many, many other things you've done. Ah, uh, thanks a lot. I, I, I'm a big John C. Riley fan. I couldn't believe it when he was cast in the movie. Um, he was just amazing. Well, this has been a great pleasure. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, the The dates for the auction, June 16th through June 18th. But anybody watching this probably is well aware of that. It's certainly underneath us in the video. Um, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, it seems that the art is doing extraordinarily well with a couple of weeks to go before the auction. So I assume you're pretty excited as things begin to ramp up here in the next several days. Yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting to see. Um, obviously, from a purely financial point of view, I've got that stake in it. But also, I'm just really, really curious to see what they go for and see how much love that is out there for these. So, like some of these pieces have been in my collection for 20 years. And yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating now. The world has changed so much over that 20 year period. I'm really looking forward to seeing you know, where they go and just, just how um, 
how frantic the bidding gets. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to it as well. And here people can see a little bit of it. There's, I mean, we didn't even talk about Will Eisner. We haven't talked about uh, any number of artists who are uh, throughout this collection, but it's an incredibly impressive one. And I know you, you've kept on to, to, to big pieces of it, but um, if this is what you're letting go, I can't even imagine what you've uh, managed to hang on to. So Darren, thanks so much for doing this and I wish you the best of luck and we'll, we'll speak soon. Thanks a lot, Robert. Cheers. Thank you.